Okay, it's at noon. Uh, we're going to give folks just, or 9 o'clock on the, on the West Coast where Gene is, we're going to give folks just a few more seconds to be able to uh, climb on the line here. Gene and Najee, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Andy Davis. I am uh, the Associate Vice President of Education and Outreach here at Board Source, and we're excited uh, to have you back for another one of our uh, Zoom live stream conversations on Facebook. Um, we've uh, heard from you tons of questions on our Ask the Expert page. Just as a reminder, that Ask the Expert page is still up. It's still running. We would love for you to hear your questions there, uh, and we will try to publish those uh, anonymously, of course. Um, uh, and answer questions because if you've got that question, we're sure that other folks have uh, questions as well. And one of the reasons that we have decided to uh, tackle this topic today is because we were seeing an uptick in uh, questions around big organizational decisions for the organization um, and where to go now that we're kind of a month and a half or so into this crisis. Um, folks are starting to see general trends of where their organization is heading. Um, some uh, in, in, in areas that are scary in, in places that we haven't had to have conversations about in the past. And so today's um, kind of conversation or our Q&A uh, with Nadja and Jean is really going to center around, you know, um, paths forward. And if that is uh, partnership opportunities, is that uh, mergers, um, is that dissolution of organizations, and everything in between. So we're really going to tackle each one of these. So uh, without further ado, I would love to just introduce our, our guest. That's Nadia Shmobonian. Uh, she is uh, really, we, we read uh, her Sea Change article a few weeks ago. We thought she would be perfect for this uh, topic. I mentioned it uh, uh, previously, uh, and I will put the link up to uh, the leading during these times, uh, but around the hibernator uh, hybrid and uh, the first responder mindset of or organizations that are in those different positions. But Nadja is the director of the nonprofit repositioning fund and a partner at Sea Change Capital Partners. The repositioning fund is a Philadelphia based pool fund, pooled fund of philanthropic partners that encourage and supports mergers and other types of formal long term strategic alliances and restructuring opportunities among nonprofit organizations in the greater Philadelphia region. And then you also know Gene. Gene was on with us uh, four or five weeks ago uh, to talk about legal issues uh, dealing to COVID and how we're operating. But he is a principal at NEO Law Group, uh, contributing publisher of the nonprofit Law Blog, and a lecturer at Columbia University. So, without further ado, well, let's just uh, let's just get in here. And and Nadja, I'll start with you. Many organizations right now are facing. Uh, I think what the biggest problem for them is. Uh, a lack of control about their future um, and the fear of kind of the unknown of where we're going. Uh, what's the best way do you think right now to approach financial planning and scenario planning uh, for a CEO working with the board right now? Can you finish the last sentence? You broke up for a second. Sorry. When, when we think about this in, in terms of the partnership that a board and CEO, how, how do they work together thinking about scenario and financial scenario planning, budgeting, financial planning right now during these times? Sure, thank you. Well, uh, first, thanks to you, Andy, and to Board Source for tackling these tough decisions and tough issues today. Um, I think there's no more important time to be a nonprofit board member and the role of the board chair and the delicate dance between the board chair and the nonprofit leader could not be important um, through these uncertain times. Um, I think the first, the first thing that we say, and I think the article you're referring to, Tough Times Call for Tough Action, is more than anything, the board can help the staff focus and refocus and reassess mission, uh, that mission first and making all decisions about how to preserve that mission. And they could, that can take all kinds of different forms. As you in, introduced, it could be through a different kind of partnership. It could be um, some redirection of the actual programs in this environment. But if you stay true to the mission in this uncertain time, you at least have a North Star. The tactical decisions below that line are extraordinary. And the board chair and Board, board member responsibility to work with and support the staff 
in um, I think scenario planning is important. We always counsel that at Sea Change risk management involves um, ongoing constant um, scenario planning some organizations may not have gotten used to that but here we are this is this is a scenario that given the best risk risk management planning could never have anticipated but if you've got if you flex those muscles before it will help but i think it in some ways it gets us out of the the classic five-year strategic plan and that, you know, we're, we're going to move in that way this is a time for adaptive leadership adaptive change and adaptive planning. And so focusing on the mission, second focus, focusing on cash conservation wherever you can and making essential decisions that stay true to the mission, but may in many ways affect how you're operating structured. And so many of, I know our listeners have already leaned into those difficult decisions and presumably also bearing mission first and foremost, but um, I'll stop there and certainly take other other questions as we go. Yeah, Jean, I'd, I'd love to hear. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Jean, did, did you have any uh, kind of anything to add there or, or, or any thoughts? Uh, first, 100% in agreement with Nadia. And, and I'll, I'm going to shout out to Nadia. I actually wrote another article that I read called Notes from a Wind Down that's available on Issue Lab by Candid. And another really helpful piece here. But adding to the to the discussion on what the CEO and, and the board's roles are during this very, very challenging circumstance. Um, uh, I'll add that mission focus is of course important. I'm gonna add kind of another layer to this and ensure that you are uh, advancing your mission with focus on your values as well. And that may determine, help you determine what the very core pieces of your mission are, what your core activities are, what your core programs are, um, what your, uh, who your core employees are. Um, and there, there are going to be a lot of elements in there where perhaps, you know, if we're rebuilding our organization, um, we're not going to be able to preserve everything. Um, and we may have been very lean and mean in the advancing mission in the first place. So we're going to have to really strip it down even further and think about that. The CEO is going to be inundated with day-to-day -day management tasks and trying to engage supporters and trying to find allies and trying to figure things out and, and allay the fears of, of uh, staff and employees and volunteers and everybody else, the board can just play a huge role right now. And Nadia talked about this a little bit um, just before we got on today about the board in a startup organization being heavily involved with, with um, what's going on with an operation and then maybe leaning back a little bit as the CEO um, uh, and the organization evolve. Um, but these are changed circumstances and she made the, the brilliant observation that we're almost back in startup time again where the board has got to be involved. Scenario planning is a big part of it, but just so much um, that boards can do right now um, and CEOs should rely on their boards. They should engage them heavily at this point and, and boards should be ready to, to, to jump in. Yeah, I, I think that, that um, when we talk about boards being ready to participate and, and being ready to jump in and, and the CEO needs a partner in this time, uh, one question that we've gotten from board members is how to understand their true financial position and burden rate and what tools should they be utilizing and how, what kind of questions around these items should they be asking of the CEO? Uh, do, do you have any thoughts on that, Gene? Well, having a great understanding of the financial statements and ensuring that got accurate financial statements on maybe even a weekly basis um, is becoming very, very important. Um, some boards may review, are used to reviewing financials like every couple of months or every quarter. Um, these times demand much more scrutiny on that level, at least in, in the summary session. Um, if boards aren't very familiar with how to read things like cash flow statements um, and understanding their balance sheets and uh, what their solvency position is, getting outside help uh, or getting a board member who has that financial expertise who can explain it to the board, we want to make sure all the board members understand it. And of course, you want to make sure your CEO is in full understanding. Uh, of, of financials in these times, how to interpret them, 
and how to understand that existing assumptions um, from the past may not be the same set of assumptions you're looking at moving forward. Yeah, and I, I just would, I totally agree with Jean, and I would just add um, throughout this period, this is not a time for boards to engage in what we refer to as magical thinking. And one of the most helpful things board members can do, I think Jean's right to the extent they can beam in necessary augmentation to the financial skills and management of the staff and kind of letting go of that need for arm's length removed when you are in a crisis and you are effectively a startup in a new environment. Um, but board member, particularly the board chair, being a partner to the executive director or CEO during this time to help that leader interpret, face into the financial realities of today and with a real sense of urgency as well as a real sense of reality. And I would, I really do refer to it as a compassionate, tough love dance, right? I mean, there's no, a, a CEO could not need support more than in this moment. Everything's changed. Their employees are scattered. The services may have changed. The demand, if you're a responder organization, has gone through the roof and is more expensive and everything you had planned for has changed. So being there, and frankly, even almost on a daily basis from the, the chair um, ED standpoint, may be what's necessary. And it depends on the makeup of that ED. Some folks need more of a push to, to kind of let go of, well, if we just wait until the fundraiser that's been postponed to the fall, we're gonna be okay. And you know what? You may just have to wait and say, show me how that works. Um, show me your cash flows that get you from April 28th to October 10th. How are we going to do that? And and doing that entirely with a with a measure of compassion and empathy for that leader, and knowing if you need to call in the Mounties, whether it's from other board members or if you have the luxury of at least a little bit of external um, um, technical assistance, but to help support that leader through this tough passage because they're dealing with all the staff. And they're dealing and working with them in a way they've never had to work with them before. Many of them, you know, haven't seen their staff in person for weeks now. Yeah. So this is an area that I, I, I think you know, it's, it's it's now the opportunity to kind of dive into some of these questions that may have been uh, tougher asks a few weeks ago. But I think when you talk a lot about <laughs> non-magical thinking, um, I think. There's a conversation to be had here around the board's role in, you know, just like you were saying, CEO oversight, um, understanding what levers to push, where to start thinking. You know, if 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 organizations are still saying, well, we just had to postpone that fundraiser for three months, I think you're you're exactly right. And and you and good board members understand where to lean in on their CEO and where to understand, hey, the CEO's got this, and I need to be deploying my my energy elsewhere. But one thing that we've talked about kind of in our pre-calls and a place that I would love to, to hear you speak more on, both of you, is this energy around preserving the organization and, and being optimistic and kind of the polarities around trying to remain as optimistic as possible about uh, future forecasting for the organization while also um, <laughs> governing the organization in current realities and also weighing worst case scenarios against best case scenarios and how the board should manage that conversation with themselves and with the CEO. So I'd love, Gene, if you have any thoughts. That's a lot and, yeah, that you, you, you listed out there. Um, all super important. I, I think in terms of, of what you had stated in the beginning of trying to determine um, how to create this um, sustainable organization that's going to be able to move forward um, in that optimistic way. It really is upon um, the leader's shoulders to, to show strength and confidence at this time, but that has to be underpinned by the board uh, exemplifying that leadership as well and saying, you know what, we are focused on our mission. We are focused on the beneficiaries that we serve um, and we are going to find a way to serve them no matter what happens. Um, we're not going to be um, arrogant about our organizational existence or about our individual 
desires and needs, but we really are going to be focused um, uh, on delivering what we can, the best we can, um, to those that we serve uh, within the defined values that we have for our organization in our service to our, our charitable class of beneficiaries and to ourselves. Um, so thinking about how to do all that um, with confidence when, you know, there are moments in everybody's lives now where, where there's a lot of tears and there's a lot of anger and the whole five stages, I think we've all probably gone through all of those uh, as well, is, is really tough. Um, and being vulnerable, um, while I said confidence and optimism are super important, I don't think vulnerability necessarily is a weakness. And I think it can help in sharing the combined strength of the staff to say, hey, we're in this together and we all are in this for the same reasons. Uh, and let's figure out the best way to do it. And I think that's maybe the starting point, Andy, and I think we'll probably um, peel the onion a little bit further as we, as we keep discussing it. Yeah, and I, I would just I I would just add to that when we had our first call last week, this question of preserving the organization and the board's role in that um, came up, and you know I that's where I think I took some exception. I mean, of course, you want to preserve the organization if at all possible, and if it can re remain and be a vibrant contributor to the beneficiaries you're trying to serve. Um, I actually really prefer to think about it as preserving the mission um, and the legacy of an institution because, you know, let's face it, things change over time. So there may be elements of that mission, even in the best of circumstances, that can best be served in another way and even by another organization or in partnership with another organization. And, you, you know, you mentioned that um, one of the hats I wear is um, directing something called the, the Re Nonprofit Repositioning Fund in Philadelphia. Uh, we, we work to help boards and um, nonprofit leaders who are looking at some kind of permanent sustained collaboration between two or more organizations. And sometimes this means one of those organizations effectively is acquired by another, but they do this in with a mind toward, you know, our mission is more important than our organizational boundaries. Um, our need to serve those kids is going to be perpetuated by joining a larger platform or turning over our greatest assets to another agency so that it, it has a chance for a sustainable and greater community impact. And uh, that's what you know. I've, we've been doing in Philadelphia, and frankly, we're part of a national movement of other cities and regions that are helping to make these kinds of partnerships come true. And each of us enjoys um, a pooled funding community of funders who are the typically the capacity building funders in our communities and cities who recognize that sometimes it it. it the, the whole is greater than the sum of the individual parts. If you if you have like missions and a really strong, well conceived, um, shared purpose, and nonprofits, unlike for profits, don't have the benefit of ample working capital to help make these assessments, and so we provide small grants to help not these pairs or groups of nonprofits exploring some time, type of transaction. To, to retain the, the expertise they need from consultants or lawyers or um, accountants who can really help them assess the, the wisdom of a potential transaction. And that that was before this. We're now into this wave. And I think we all of my just spoke with my colleagues in other cities last week, and we all are anticipating right now a bit of a calm because people are just trying to find their footing but a tsunami of interest in um, kind of what we refer to as repositionings or strategic uh, sustained collaborations. And in some instances, dissolutions, which we can also talk about. Uh, we're all concerned about that in our respective communities. 
Yeah, we'll definitely get to that here shortly. Whitney has a question, and, and if I haven't well, reminded folks on the line, we'd love to have your questions. Uh, just put them right there into the chat function of Facebook, and we will get to those questions as they come in. But Whitney uh, wants to know, and this is a, we were kind of starting to hit on this, Nigel was, what would be indicators that an organization still has time to initiate a merger process to preserve the mission core versus having to think about dissolution? Well, I'd go back to um, Jane's caution and advice originally in terms of know your burn rate, know what your time is. I can tell you it takes longer than you think. Um, so even from the moment you have the aha, we should be looking for a merger partner or we have this group we've identified, we've worked with them before. It is a laborious process under the best of circumstances. And so know that you've got just back it up well before where you think you need to start that conversation. And I encourage people uh, and boards that, um, that these conversations should be as routine as succession planning are supposed to be in boardrooms. That, you know, at least once a year should do a walk around and just like you do a walk around of your senior staff as their in-house in succession opportunity and so on, I encourage boards uh, and leaders to be thinking about are there ways we could partner differently with folks who we may have been thinking of as competitors and are there some creative given where we are strategically now could we be stronger by virtue of a different kind of partnership but so if you've practiced that um, and certainly this is a moment to be asking those questions for every probably every board uh, but if you've practiced it I think you, you can start anticipating how how much goes into it and um, the time you need so it, it's know your cash run rate, your burn rate um, know who's out there and know what it is you seek to achieve by forming some kind of a strategic collaboration with another institution I'll just throw with that if we focus on what Nadia said, which I agree with 100% as well as focusing on the mission and not just the organization itself, dissolution is not necessarily the end, right? You still have the same people who are interested in furthering the mission, the same supporters, the same team, maybe not acting in coordinated matter anymore, but all who may want to support that mission and looking for a way to do that. That strategic collaboration with other organizations may be a possibility. That may come in connection with a dissolution. It may come in connection with a merger or something in between um, those things. So the sort of the decision about dissolution or merger isn't strictly based on the financial position or the resources available for the organization that might be more troubled. It may just be what is going to work best our organization and what options do we have obviously the more runway you have in terms of making that decision the more options there are going to be um, you'll be more attractive to a, another partner for a merger and being able to get people on from your board onto their board if you come with more resources and more assets if you're already insolvent that's going to be a harder sell yeah. um, so the runway is going to allow you to have more options but the solution isn't shouldn't be seen as a failure. It should be seen as a way to move forward in a different manner. And you're going to have to think about the best way to do that, to preserve as much as you can to keep advancing that mission. I, I could tell a story from the dissolution banks. Um, I was actually going to bring that up and ask you to share if you didn't mind. Well, yes. And Jean referenced a, an article I had written, which was really done as a personal catharsis, um, just because I did um, have the honor of leading a remarkable national nonprofit, um, public private ventures, and was brought in to help turn it around for a range of reasons. There had been a series of challenges in the organization and worked like a dog to do that the first year I was there and had the hubris to believe that no matter what, I could turn this thing around. And it was an organization I had given grants to years and years ago, renowned working in, uh, with disadvantaged uh, young people providing evaluation services and um, sometimes many year research studies. And we were in this incredible campaign to envision the new future for PPB. 
and went to our board meeting on January 27th, 2010. And I will always remember the day because it's, I had a board member who beamed in what I referred to as the question, which at the time, my senior staff and I were furious that it was lobbed into the room. But the question was, after we'd had this great day about our future and what we were planning, he asked, so Nadja, how much, do you know how much it would cost to close down the organization responsibly? And you, I mean, any of you who are out there who lead organizations, you can imagine how derailing that was. But we all went home and worked um, you know, through the weekend, through the next weeks to try to actually answer that question. And when you answer that question, you find out, this is again to the runway, when you answer that question, you find out, wow, it costs a lot if you want to preserve the mission and values, as Jean has suggested, of the organization. And in our case, that meant being able to transfer research projects to other organizations so eight years of research wouldn't be squandered. It meant being able to think responsibly about placing our talented staff in other like organizations if we had the time to do so. And it meant, in the case of PPV, it meant how do we capture the 35-year repository, repository of past research and literature that has been critical to this field? How do we find a home for that? And you know, we were able, by virtue of having that number, for the next year, we tracked it. And when we got too close to it, that's when we had to make the very difficult decision to move into what we referred to as a responsible wind down. Uh, because we wanted to control our destiny and place that legacy and mission and preserve it. And it wasn't preserving the organization. We moved past that. And that was the saddest, hardest thing I've ever done professionally. But we all, I've never seen the staff work harder than we did to make that happen in a 15 week period. And, you know, I think it's just, it's finding a new mission and a new purpose in a very difficult circumstance. And, you know, I referred to it as planned retreat. And I think in these days and in this environment, we need to do that and hold our heads high and feel like it's a, it's a reasonable, and perhaps necessary step, but you want to be able to control it as much as possible um, if you care about the work. Yeah, a, a theme that I'm hearing throughout this conversation is around intentionality. And, and unfortunately, if you know some organizations were in the in, in the position where they had been intentional about planning and, and thinking about um, uh, you know their finances or their organization's position, of course nobody could plan for the, the situation we are in. But when we think about backing up just a couple of minutes, when we think about um, finding potential partners to be able to work with um, and thinking about what we bring to the table and how we're willing to uh, share our own resources or share our own power, there's a couple of questions I want to ask here around that. First of all, uh, I, I do want to let folks know I put a link to Board Sources Power Possibility Campaign um, in the comments here that that will provide you with a ton of resources to help with strategic partnerships. Um, everything from starting the conversation with your board, resources for helping find uh, people in your community that can create connections between organizations. But when we start to think about, uh, Gene, uh, the, the, the legal or financial implications of being able to share assets or be able to release assets to a new organization, if we're in this time and this is a, a decision we have made that we want to create a new partnership, perhaps that is um, turning over a program to an organization or acquiring a program from a different organization. What are some of the questions that board members should be asking and, and, and things they should be thinking about um, when, when talking about transferring assets or programs or um, even just starting the conversation? Sure. Um, so I'll take a legal approach to, to start off with. And, and the legal approach says that if you're going to transfer assets, you have to be careful if you're if the transferor, the, the party that's transferring the D assets, is actually solvent or not. Because if they are insolvent and transferring assets, especially if they have financial value, that could be deemed a fraudulent transfer. And there could be clawback provisions so that a creditor out there could actually try to acquire those assets from the grantee, the transferee. 
uh, that received those assets. From a legal framework, what you want to be careful of with both parties to ensure is that you have the ability to either transfer the assets as the transferor uh, or receive those assets without the danger of clawback from a creditor as the transferee. So that's just on a very, very legal, um, restrictive view of that situation. Obviously, there's much more to this in terms of uh, integration, in terms of negotiation, in terms of preservation of mission and programs and possibly employees that are associated with the program and what leverage each party has in order to um, uh, create the best scenario for themselves. From the party that's transferring the program over, they probably want to transfer not only all of the program assets, but any liabilities that might be associated with that program since the assets are going over as well. From the acquiring party, they may say, well, we want your program assets, but we may not want those liabilities that were associated with those assets. Um, and there is going to be some negotiation involved, and leverage is obviously going to be a part of it. Again, if both parties are seeing themselves not as adversaries, but allies in furtherance of the same mission. Hopefully that discussion is not so difficult and you get to an agreement um, where you can work towards best serving the beneficiaries you, you are targeting. Mm -hmm. Najee, you look like you might have something to add here. Well, I was just gonna say, and again, it, it, it's not a luxury that everyone has, but I think this network that I talked about of initiatives like the one I, I lead in Philadelphia, we all feel very strongly that to have those kind of negotiations in a constructive way, even if you enter as good working colleagues who've been in partnership for five, 10 years, uh, or worked side by side at a, you know, whatever, a, a, a summer program or, or whatever you have in common, it does help to have, you know, either a, a wise and thoughtful, experienced nonprofit lawyer like Jean or to have someone who has been engaged in the kind of negotiations that are helpful in getting, making sure that everything is aligned, which includes not just the, the technical structural platforms, but I think the hardest thing is integrating cultures, um, both board and staff cultures and attending to that. Sometimes, you know, well, certainly in, in every instance, if you can afford to, and if you can identify someone who's got good experience um, in that kind of kind of facilitative process it makes a major difference um, in getting to a, a good and timely um, transaction resolution um it's great advice and Nadja, i know that, that that you work in kind of this space but any advice for organizations looking for potential partners and then the process of going through and, and trying to vet those partners uh third-party assistance things that, you know, first of all, finding the partners and, and then what should we be thinking about once we think about a potential partner, although I know you and Jean just, just really kind of went there. So thank you. Yeah, just, I mean, just a couple words. Um, we all of, all of us in these different cities, when we compare notes, we've, we've all asked, have you ever helped make matches happen? And we really, we all say we're, we're, we're not, we're not matchmakers. Um, and, but at the same time, we're all wondering in this moment, in this market where there is such there are such shifts, whether we can or should be um, some kind of a different resource there. But I guess the advice I would say to people, which is what I share with folks in Philadelphia, um, it is look at look at who has been a competitor, um, who or you might have termed a competitor, and look at what they what they bring to the market that you don't, and are there ways in which you could imagine the complementarities between your two organizations could make you stronger? Um, obviously, there's got to be um, great alignment in terms of mission and values. Um, that, again, has to do with the cultural integration of the organization. Um, but it, it's being self-aware, first and foremost, getting your own house in order, which is assessing you know, what would you hope to achieve by joining with another organization, what what are you looking to grow? Whether it's new licensure, uh, new accreditation, new geographies, new product lines, um, certain staff even, um, and what what are you not willing to let go of, and what do you have to offer? So, 
just going through those essential um, assessments of what you've got to offer, what you don't want to lose in the, in the potential collaboration, and what values, again, have to rise above and be upheld so you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater if you're contemplating a significant organizational change. Thanks. Go ahead, Jane. Uh, I was just going to add, in, in, in agreement with everything Matt just said, but I, I was just going to add that um, engagement um, is really important now. And there may be this tendency for organizations to dive deep inside within themselves to try to get through this crisis, but engaging with outside communities, not just donors or former donors, but potential allies, competitors, even if you didn't have a relationship with them before, engaging with your community foundations, um, groups of consultants, just getting out there and using your full network. So this is, again, where the board can really be valuable because the CEO will only have so many contacts. The staff may have some additional contacts, but the board is likely to have some contacts that those, those individuals don't have. Um, and reaching out and trying to figure out ways to be able to move forward in collaboration with other parties who are probably, many of whom are going through the same difficult time, um, can be a resource for creativity, for potential restructuring. And maybe the best way to keep your advancing your mission isn't by doing it the same way at a smaller level. Maybe it's doing it a different way. And without some of that outside thinking, you might not come to that. Yeah, and I think, I, I think it presents a creative challenge for those of us in the collaboration space who encourage this kind of assessment. Um, because um, I think, Sorry, I just lost everybody. Um, because what you're describing, Jean, I couldn't agree with more, but obviously in this moment, how that networking gets done, I, I do think there may need to be more proactive spaces created to invite that. Um, and none of us have quite gone there, but I, um, I, I worry, and I think we're all watching very carefully because to to engage in, let's just say, a merger in the in the best of circumstances or the pre-January world we lived in was a, is, it is and was a very um, arduous and kind of personally challenging um, passage. And to now do that through Zoom and, you know, with boards that haven't met each other, with senior staff who haven't met each other, and we're, we're obviously there's a lot of anxiety approaching these um, these potential changes. I think we're going to have to really take this in a in a pretty creative way to imagine. I'm not offering any answer here, but what you raise is to, I'm just supporting this this need to tap your networks. And I think consultants can be very thoughtful. Like, I, you, know, you, you could go into one organization and see they're looking for a partner and hear from someone else. We try to, we try to avoid that for conflict of interest. We don't want to appear to be pushing any kind of agenda, but um, still creating and making the space for, uh, for kind of unstructured opportunities for nonprofits to meet um, very new media is going to be a challenge. Yeah. Uh I actually just got a great question about this, and, and, um, and Jean, I thought your conversation about how we tackle these um, these challenges may not look like it did a few months ago, or 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 month, weeks ago, or months ago. But the challenge still remains, and we might have to approach it differently. I, we had Anthony uh, Bud Levine on a couple of weeks ago, and and I thought that his imagery around we're still climbing the same mountain. But, you know, there might be a giant boulder or an avalanche in our path now, but the mountain hasn't changed. And so thinking about it, uh, that your, your challenge, your core purpose um, is, is still there, um, and even though the organization might be altered. So we had a question about these conversations, about starting to think about uh, mergers or dissolutions. Uh, that these, kind, these kinds of intense boardroom conversations deserve confidentiality. How or when do we know, uh, or how or when do nonprofit leaders begin communicating some of these scenarios to their constituents without inducing panic? 
I'll just I'll open it up to both of you. Jane, do you want to start or does? Sure. Um, I'm trying to give it some thought in my head, but um, uh, right away, what, what comes to mind is there's a little bit of tension uh, between keeping everything confidential uh, and opening it up uh, a little bit anyway, so you have more information uh, from which to decide whether moving forward with a potential collaboration makes sense or not. So there's that dynamic that always will exist. I think I'm leaning more towards not encouraging a lot of confidentiality, but encouraging organizations to approach things um, without a sense of there being the alternative of an organ one organization dying or dying on the vine because the collaboration doesn't happen. We often talk about strategic collaboration being best when both organizations are not in positions of um, heavy weaknesses, um, just so that they have the leverage to move their in individual missions, which might be slightly different from, from each other, forward. But under extraordinary circumstances at these times, um, it may be, it becomes a little bit more difficult to, to to do that. So the confidentiality that we normally see in a merger discussion, because if the merger discussions fail, we don't want the public to get a sense that, oh no, one organization's in trouble, may be in a little bit of a different space right now. Um, and we have to think about how we're talking about it, probably not necessarily as a merger, but more as a collaborative effort and see what goes from, from there in terms of uh, building up support for the idea of looking for collaboration rather than seeing it as a merger and a point of weakness of one organization. Yeah, um, I, and I, I think I don't know the answer to that in this environment. We just, um, I was surprised, but we um, have our normal grant cycles and we had a deadline on March 13th and I had three proposals I was expecting. And I was concerned that with everything up in the air as it was, that they I, they would not come in. Actually, all three came in, but one of them, which was for implementation of a merger, they were ready to go. Um, they they said that it that so we we gave them the grant, um, but in the conversations with them leading into that, they said the the puzzle they hadn't yet solved for was they had been planning on having joint announcements to their respective staffs in April, which as you can imagine, as you suggested in the question, Andy, um, is a sensitive kind of ex extension of, the, of the, the cone of silence. And you begin to acculture, acculturate the, the different staff members to it. And they recognize that that might not be so easy to do in a virtual construct. And if you think about the you know, the natural desire of a leader to be able to kind of pull in the, the flock and embrace them through what is a really fundamentally, you know, almost existential change, um, but not yet being comfortable enough in this online world to know how to navigate it. You know, we're gonna, we're just gonna be looking, learning and seeing how different leaders navigate that. And I think every, Every deal is going to be different anyway. In terms, even again, pre-COVID nineteen, every deal is different based on how well the, the agencies know each other, how deep do the ties between you know the, the respective staffs, how do they, how far, how far is that down into the organization, um, how aligned are things? That that will tell a lot about how closely held you need to keep it. But if it's a really new radical potential partnership, how you do that, this, and you know how you achieve that thoughtfully in this environment. Um, and again, you're going to be bringing in some outside help to get you through it. But um, I, I think I, I hear the desire for more confidentiality, but I also think being really measured and thoughtful about how well you're you're navigating just this way of communicating and leading as you go into those discussions, because you, you do lose a certain amount of 
collective hold, I think, in, in this in this online world, or at least the perception of it, whether it's real or any different, I don't know. But I can see for leaders, it's it's a, an unnerving prospect. Yeah, and it, it kind of um, triggers a couple of different thoughts for me about communication and uh, planning, both internally and externally. And I know we had a, a brief conversation about this uh, last week, Gene, but I we kind of started hitting on the topic of which uh, of equity and, and how uh, a focus on equity can get lost in these more difficult conversations sometimes. It becomes about what's urgent, what's now, what's needed, and we forget about the things that we've said that we're baking into every part of our organization. So when we have these conversations, or when we're having a conversation about having the conversation, making sure that you're giving the right voices um, at the table seems like an important place for, for, for me to consider who am I listening to, how is the community or the purpose that I'm here to serve represented. But I want to also take it to another way, and that's internal approaches to organizational shifts. If, if we're talking about downsizing or if we're talking about collaboration, and that might mean a reduction in force, um, Gene, what are some ways that we can think about equity within our organization as we prepare for staff shifts? It's a, it's a great and super difficult question at the same time. And I think it needs to be approached in a manner that says downsizing um, and uh, trying to create efficiencies uh, through staff uh, layoffs um, or termination um, can be a, a dangerous place to perpetuate inequities that existed in the system that you know, it was inequitable to start out with, even if the board and the leadership had been in the process of trying to make things more equitable. A good example of that is you were trying to create more diversity and inclusion uh, in your staff force. So your newest employees tend to be more representative of persons of colors or uh, other uh, persons that, that added to your diversity, however you want to define that. And then deciding on a staff reduction that you're going to take away the newest employees now it puts you right back into the same problem you were in and that may not be the right way to think about it that's where board leadership can also be very important and why i introduced um the idea of not just advancing your mission but advancing your values as you make these decisions so i think that becomes a really important decision in deciding how you want to restructure not just downsize but restructure what you're doing in your programming, you definitely want to keep the core of what's working, but you do want to reimagine it a little bit and decide how do we restructure it in a way that's sensitive to our staff and sensitive of things like seniority, which I don't want to underplay, but also thinking about equity considerations in there as well. Again, no one size answers, but that those discussions need to be had. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you have any, uh, anything to add there, Roger? Um, no, I just couldn't agree more, and I think that's a, a great example of where the values alignment is absolutely critical, and the board needs to uphold that and challenge and question and hold leadership accountable for making sure those values survive, whatever the passage is of the organization. Yeah, when we think about, you know, making sure the values survive and, 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 and making sure that we understand that a board is more than the organization, it is the purpose, um, and, and how to move that forward. I, it, I also come back to this piece around um, financial planning, and even for an organization that may be in a relatively stable position, understanding that while we may be in a reopening phase for the next few months, we may be back to a relative workplace normal uh, within the next few months or, or who knows how long that is, but the economic repercussions of what is happening today could have a very long tail and we could be dealing with these um, these issues for years and years. So I just wonder uh, if both of you could speak to um, what are what actions we should be thinking about today uh, that will impact our, you know, FY21, FY22 and beyond. And, and really, you know, we, I think a, a common theme through all of our conversations has been intentionality and understanding that mission and, and, and purpose uh, rise of, above all. But do you have any thoughts about how we can be thinking today that may impact this organization or, or, or what we should be looking out for that could have a negative impact on this organization, maybe not in the short term, but in the long term? 
I mean, I guess I would say if ever there was an eyes wide open time, it's now. And understanding your financial position now. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't want to be, I mean, it's a tough question toward the end of this session because what's coming down the pike is not necessarily rosy. And I will start by saying, you know, my bias is that what was happening in the nonprofit sector before we got into this COVID-19 mess was not working for the majority of nonprofits. Um, and so it was not like returning to normal is still, in my view, not a desired state for delivering on social purpose um, in this country. And so as board members, you need to recognize that you know, about half of all U.S. non or 40% of all U.S. nonprofits didn't have more than two months of cash on hand um, before this. And, you know, 10% had greater net liabilities than assets. Um, and so if that's where we started, and now we go into this tunnel where everything's, you know, there's, first of all, there's health. I mean, the health of the workers and the workforce and the to the to the people's lives who are working with you. But looking at sustainability, there's no question that the local and state governments are taking a massive hit. And that's going to, that's starting to play out. I know in Pennsylvania, um, we're starting to hear what the next budget's going to hold. And that's before the other shoe was fully dropped. Um, similarly, like for those of us who lived through the, the recession of 2008, 9, 10, philanthropic sources, um, there's some great and compelling responses now um, but the reality is their spending rules and so on, and you know, two, three years out are very, you know, will we see the same level of giving? I suspect not, if, uh, depending on what happens with the market. But um, it, there are some pretty profound shocks ahead. So I would like to think that all of us are really open to imagining how social purpose mission and values can be sustained and probably in structures that will look differently. And I know, Jean, we touched um, before on the whole concept of even fiscal sponsorship. Um, and I have come to believe in the five years I've been in this sustained collaboration work, it's a really, really important vehicle to consider. And so that's something that I urge nonprofit leaders and boards to, to look at, just like we're talking about collaborations, just as we're, as we're looking at, in some instances, dissolution. But fiscal sponsorship has a, a tremendous potential, both incubating new ideas before you go out and start a 501c3, but also midlife and later in life or even end of life, you can see some of your work continue and probably do it in a far more cost-effective and networked way with folks who are in the same line of work um, through quality fiscal sponsorship. And, you know, I'm, I, I make that plug everywhere I go now because I really believe it's something that we, we have not even begun to scratch the, the surface in terms of what that might yield us. And I always use the word quality because that matters. But it serves, it's a platform for advocacy within a field. It's a platform for shared services. It's a platform, I mean, it just, and it, it allows leaders to focus in a perfect world. They, they're more focused on the actual programs than they are on dealing with the IRS compliance and the, the work of sustaining and, you know, caring and feeding for a, a, an individual 501c3. So I'm going to shut up about it, but I want to make sure you've been very involved with the national network of uh, fiscal sponsors and have your own thoughts, I know. Uh, I'm in 100% agreement with the possible use of quality fiscal sponsors. Um, and funders have to understand that as well, because some funders have a preference not to fund fiscal sponsors because they've had some bad experience. But it's about finding the right fiscal sponsors, both for projects that are looking for sponsorship and funders that feel confident about funding them, that I think is really important. In terms of, Andy, your, your question um, that, that you raised, I wanted to refocus on mission resiliency and urgency. And these times are, are, are really um, just epic times where, where we're not going back to 
to what we were three months ago. Um, and we can't use the, uh, the excuse of this is completely unforeseeable anymore. Now we know, uh, we know that there are crises like this that may be foreseeable. We've always kind of known about natural disasters and we've learned about terrorism, we know about wars, but now we know that there are other threats out there to our organizations, not only to our organizations, but to our communities, to our nonprofit sector, indeed to our country. And so right now, I would say that when we're trying to think about mission resiliency, one of the most important steps that boards need to think about in terms of furthering their mission is advocacy. Because as Nadia said, you know, where we put our funds is really important. And with state and local government funding going down, unemployment skyrocketing, we're in this different world. And as we are getting these stimulus packages and huge amounts of money being injected back into the system, if we don't see the nonprofit sector getting funding from some of this, and people should realize how much government funding is a huge, huge part of why the nonprofit sector exists in the first place, if we don't see that included in these stimulus packages, and thank you to the work of all the anchor organizations that are really advocating for this and fighting for this, um, we're really in trouble with the sector. So it's, it's a time to sort of jump on, collaborate in whatever ways you can, but certainly collaborate in cost-effective ways by signing your name, signing your organization uh, up, join state associations um, uh, that are advocating for, for both state and federal laws that are going to be supportive of your communities that you're trying to serve, of your organizations that you're leading. Um, I, I would say that's just a, a big part of building a resilient, reimagined, nonprofit sector serving as best as they can under the circumstances and we're in new times we're not just trying to preserve and get back to what we were we're, we're trying to adapt and adaptability might be one of the most important traits now of, of resilient organizations yeah i think it's it's incredibly important to remember you know and it, that that just like gene said this is the, the time if there ever was one a time for advocacy and also remembering that there's kind of a, a dual track here that organizations should be operating on um, working with these anchor organizations to push further federal and state legislation, but also if you're a board member for an organization, helping everyone in your organ in your community know what what it is that what services you provide, being willing to talk to local officials about the importance of your organization and what would happen if your organization and the services it provide were to go away. So we've only got a couple of uh, minutes left. I appreciate all the folks who are entering their questions. Uh, and, and just so you know, Nadja, a lot of snaps up for a lot of the things you were saying earlier, particularly around keeping your eyes wide open. Um, so uh, thank you all for those. Before we get off, I, I try to do this on the, on the end of these, these live streams. Is there something that is, is helping you um, at least attempt to, to stay sane right now? Uh, is, there, is there a way that you are practicing self-care that, uh, that you're able to share with the audience to say, hey, this is something that I've been doing that's helpful, or maybe it's just a, a good book that you read or a podcast that you found or, or something that you said, this has kind of been my respite during during these times for me. So we'll just start with you, Nadja. Well, first it presumes I was sane to begin with, but <laughs> um, <laughs> once we get past that, um, I, I honestly, Andy, I think um, I have taken the, the, the task of trying to actually hold on to some North Star vision and trying to think that through um, as a, a writing task, a way of um, engaging with, okay, when all this moves, well, when we come out of this, what will, what will allow us to continue doing the work that have made uh, nonprofits non in this country exceptional and just a, a fundamental part of the DNA of our culture? And, and what opportunities are there? How are we going to even think ethically in a values-based way of making the decisions of, frankly, rationing what are going to be scarce resources for nonprofits, nonprofits as a vehicle to serving a vast array of beneficiaries? And how are we grappling with that? So for me, on a good day, when I'm not spinning in sort of crisis reaction mode, which you know, we, we pride ourselves at Sea Change on helping nonprofits face into complex challenges. Um, it's to try to remember what this is all about 
and keep that as, as a North Star for all of the busyness of right now and trying to remember that it is the people who are in that and just holding up nonprofits matter and advocating for nonprofits and the people who work in them. I, 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 I could get on a tear on that, but that every chance I get, whether I'm teaching young people who want to do the next great thing, it's just, you know, that this work matters. It is part of who we are as a nation and um, not losing sight of that, but also being very direct and straight about what the challenges are. And I, that's the only way I can practice in this world is to not sugarcoat it, but to have great empathy, just like board members need to have great empathy and tough love at the same time. And it's big love with great empathy. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and I, I just appreciate that framing. And, and it's not easy, but, it, but it's necessary, uh, especially if we want to keep our eye on, on big change. How about you, Jean? Nothing so profound, but for, for me, just walking, um, thinking, finding humor where, where I can still, um, just to keep me sane, and then working insanely hard, trying to do all the things that not to talk about it at the same time. Well, I, and I'm sure a lot of folks out there are, are doing the same, but don't forget to take care of yourself because we need you all, um, and, and you're the ones that are, that are you know, helping us all stay afloat, and, and we need to be there for each other. So uh, with that being said, Gene and Najee, thank you for being here in person, and thank you for being willing to share your wisdom today. It was, uh, it was, it was great, um, and these hard conversations are not going to get any easier, but it helps to have experts like yourselves to, to give us a little bit of guidance and, and help us kind of focus and, and take some of the fear out of it. So I just want to tell everybody on, on, that's watching, uh, you can watch this anytime. It'll stay up on our Facebook page. As soon as we're done, it'll go uh, as a recording on our Facebook uh, uh, Facebook homepage. You can go there, send your friends, um, and we'll try to take some of these kind of juicier tidbits that uh, Nadja and Jean shared and, and share those on social media as well with you. So thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, again, Jean, Nadja, uh, just great great wisdom, and we really appreciate you being with us today. So with that being said, have a great rest of your week, everybody, and uh, please let us know here at BoardSource if you have any uh, questions. I ask the expert service is always open. Uh, we want to be a resource for you. If we don't have the answer, which we often don't, we will try to hunt them down for you. And send you to so, all right, thank you, everybody. Have a great week. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks, everyone.